Friends, it being 12 o'clock, I suppose I could greet you with both Moramai and Fastermai. But most of all, I'm here to say Happy Easter, to wish you a joyful and a happy Easter. And to be saying that at this most unlikely of times may seem slightly odd, but I mean it. And here's why. The Chief Minister has rightly said that we're at war fighting an invisible enemy, and that is absolutely correct. Now, I'm not an expert on war fighting, but I know that military doctrine tells us that fighting power has three components to it. There is a physical component, there is a conceptual component, and there is a moral component. Now, in an ordinary war, the physical component of fighting power would be everything to do with material. So anything from helicopters to weapon systems to boots and rations. The conceptual component of fighting power is the planning and the strategy that goes into it. And the moral component of fighting power is the people. And in the case of an army, it is that ethos which gives soldiers the will and the courage to fight. Now, all of those are important but one of them is more important than the other two. And in fact, it was Napoleon, of all people, who said that the moral component outweighs in value the other two combined by a proportion of two or three to one. And for that reason, I know that we are going to win this war. So if I transfer those three components of fighting power to the war in which we're engaged at the moment, perhaps it might look like this. The physical component would be our hospital wards, staffed by the astonishingly courageous health workers, health professionals who serve us. It would be the hospital wards and the beds, it would be our PPE, our testing kits and our medicine. All of that would be the physical component and that is hugely important. The conceptual component of fighting power for us in this war is what happens here in government. Everything that happens with the Council of Ministers, with government, with the civil service, with departments and with Tinwald. The planning process and the strategy. And the moral component of fighting power is you. It is us. It is the Manx people. It is all of us together. And the ethos, the spirit and the resilience that we share as an island community. That is the moral component of our fighting power. And it is on the strength of that that we will win this war. And perhaps on Easter Sunday, I can suggest this. I would say that that spirit, that ethos, that resilience has been shaped and formed by our spiritual tradition, which over centuries has taught us about what it means to live in a society that is open and generous, a society where we care for each other and look after one another, a society where everyone is invited to contribute and where no one is undermined. And that is a very precious legacy, and it is one that will serve us well in the coming days and weeks. And perhaps I might say also on Easter Sunday that the central truth of our spiritual tradition is the great story of Easter and the resurrection from death of Christ. And that teaches us that there will be a cost to these things, and we know that, but it teaches us that nothing that is of value is achieved without a struggle. Nothing that is of value comes without cost. But as we make our way through that struggle, so we achieve something wonderful. We achieve victory over that invisible enemy. And I'm reminded, perhaps, of the words of Psalm 67 that we say together at the beginning of each sitting of Tinwald Court. God will bless us. God, our own God, will bless us. And he will do so through that moral component which is earthed in our life together as a community, as a spiritual community, in the work of our key workers most certainly, but of all of us 
in coming together to fight that invisible enemy and in doing so to win and to triumph. And so, once again, I wish you a joyful and a happy and blessed Easter. I have Manx Radio, I think, coming in with a question. Happy Easter, first of all, uh, Lord Bishop. And may I begin, obviously, with condolences to the family and friends of Richie Lloyd. As you mentioned, there will be costs and uh, uh, their family must be in terrible pain at the moment. Uh, do you have any words of comfort that you could offer to them? I think I want to say that clearly all, all, all of us who would belong to a tradition of faith are praying very much for that family, for the Lloyd family at this time, and acknowledging that perhaps bearing it, bearing in mind, he, you know, he, he was a former police officer, his son I think is a serving police officer, and clearly our hearts go out to our constabulary um, and to family and friends, and all of that is held in, in deep prayer, as also are those of whom I'm aware who are, are struggling with serious illness at the moment as well. So all of this is deeply demanding and challenging. And I think at that point, again, I would want to say we can draw on that spiritual tradition and that spiritual heritage to understand something of what it means to live, to fight, and indeed, of course, to suffer together as a community. The church is obviously playing its part with doors closed and uh, even graveyards closed now, but it is continuing, isn't it? It's uh, continuing like we are talking now uh, remotely. Indeed it is. You know, and none, and none of these things are easy at all. I long for the day when our churches are open again. And the decision to close the churchyards was, was a really difficult one. But at the moment, there is only one thing that matters, and that is saving lives. That is the only thing that matters. So the contribution, for example, of churches, as with everyone else, must be earthed in saving lives, in not letting our health service be overwhelmed. And that regrettably means for now that we stay at home. And I long for the day when we can go to church again, when we can go into our churchyards, when we can visit graves. All of those things will, will come. But for now, they can wait, because all that matters at the moment is saving lives. And that is staying at home and protecting our health service. And finally, if I may, uh, there was quite a bit of debate and comment yesterday uh, across where some churches were wanting to open and uh, to have a service on Easter Sunday. Have all the churches remained closed here? There's been no such debate here as well? I don't think there has been such debate. I mean, our churches have remained closed, but they have been extraordinarily active in streaming worship. Um, I mean, I've, I've streamed acts of worship really every day this week and, and certainly this, this morning for Easter Sunday. Streamed worship is, is out there and we'll continue to do that. So the work of the churches at the moment is offering virtual worship, which is readily accessible through pretty much all media and platforms, and also, of course, continuing to serve and care for our community in all sorts of parish-based community projects of, of caring for people, of serving them and helping them. And as I mentioned earlier, in, in our life of prayer as well, in praying for our island community, in praying for one another, in praying at this time for the Lloyd family certainly, but praying for all of us. So prayer, virtual worship and care of one another, those are the ways in which the church at the moment is carrying out its ministry. Thank you, Lord Bishop. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. And I think that concludes for today. So again, wishing us all a joyful and blessed Easter in spite of the things that we face, commending these things to prayer and remembering that we come through this as an island community and we look forward to the day when once again we can rejoice in these things. Thank you.